<coughs> Let's see. YouTube. Share. You can see that. Yeah. Yep. Ten four. Okay, so after the video there, anything you'd like to add with that, Mr. Obama? Uh, I don't think we'll be being shot at, but it just kind of gives you an example of uh, how it can protect you against some uh, pretty strong things. Right, yeah. Um, as far as, you know, him using the rifle, and he, obviously he's a very good shot. Uh, the amount of speed and velocity of things coming at your eyes can be that high. So, you know, you got to protect yourself from that. Now, I know, I know a couple of people have asked me out there in the field, well, what does Z87.1 stand for? Oh, is that to me? Anybody? Electrical resistant and impact resistant. Not electrical. Uh, you're, you're close. You're on the impact part. You go to a Z89.1, it's not electrical resist. It is electrical resistant. So Z87 is an impact resistant, and it's just a standard they num number they use and letter they use in the industry, so everybody else can follow that same number. Now, the biggest acronyms that you're going to hear out there are uh, what was the one that he had at the beginning? ANSI, A N S I. Does anybody know what that stands for? It's the American National Safe Safety Institute, ANSI. OSHA, I know some of you know what OSHA stands for. <coughs> Where's ZZ Top? Like, yeah. Yeah. O Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And the one that's pretty much, uh, that takes care of a lot of stuff. The one that pretty much encompasses the industry is the NESC, National Electric Safety Code. So those are the ones you're going to be familiar with the most. Now, Professor V, you ever had an eye injury? Yes, I have. And can you give us the occurrence? Yeah. Actually, this was several. This is probably 25 years ago. Better, I was in a meeting. In, actually, just in a meeting in Florence, in a building, and I. I wear contacts, so at that time I had just um, prescription strength um, safety glasses, and that's what I had to wear. So, just I was standing in the hallway. I did not have anything. It was just a fault for the manufacturer. My right eye lens exploded, and it put glass into my eye. So I had to go get that little pieces of glass removed out of my eye. But um, as far as the safety glasses we are talking about, um, just can't, you know, stress enough how important it is, just like what you said about stuff falling off the pole and being on the bottom of your feet, falling into your eyes several times that happening, dust blowing up, um, just several issues out there where the safety glasses saved um, things from going into my, but the biggest thing was when I had safety glasses that exactly just the, the right eye exploded into my eye. Yeah. Now, the one occurrence that I had, uh, we were out on a job site and you can frame and build poles while they're still on the ground. 
or being held up by a truck and then set it in the air is I was uh, nailing in a hard head while it was uh, while we were standing on the dirt. And while I was nailing, I didn't even really feel anything. And about an hour later, you know, I started rubbing my eyes thinking I had something, you know, dust, whatever in my eye and it just didn't go away. So I went to the uh, optometrist, Trump, how do you say it? Okay. Optometrist that evening to have them take a look at it. First thing I did is I notified my supervisor. Yeah. So I've got something in my eye, I just don't know what it is. And that's the first thing I did. So I went after hours, went to the optometrist and it actually took a microscope for him to look in my eye and uh, magnify it. And I mean, guys, it was just so minute. It was a sliver of the metal that had come off the hard head and uh, punctured my eye. Yeah. And uh, he had to remove it. And once he removed it, everything was good, you know, eye drops and whatnot. So, you know, you let those things go. And it's typically in the situations, it, it's gonna be something very, very small. Yeah. All right. It's going to have uh, impact your eyes. So safety glasses, you know, are, are a must. And that's one of the minimum PPE requirements you're going to have to have on when you go out to work. Now, sunglasses or clear glasses? As long as they're safety glasses. There you go. Excellent answer right there. As long as they're Z87 glasses, uh, we were at our workplace and Professor V, if you can yeah uh, expand on duke we were we were issued uh sunglasses z87.1 sunglasses and we got the same pair of glasses in clear yep same thing so you were yeah you, if you had to work at night you got those in clear and uh, obviously you can see better without sunglasses at night uh i see some people that do have prescription what happens there is uh, the company's gonna you're gonna go to your optometrist and you're gonna get the prescription glasses and we as a company went ahead and paid for the prescription one time. So if you need a Z87.1 sunglasses or Z87.1 clear glasses, the company would pay for that one time buy of those glasses. You just need to make sure you took care of those mm -hmm. because after that, it was up to you. So if you wear a prescription. It do uh, a little different with that one. They would actually like buy us two pair of safety glasses prescriptions, you know, every, I think every other year. So they just, they pay for the exam and they pay for the safety glasses. So yeah. Gotcha. Uh, are contact lenses allowed? They used not be, but um, they changed with the, um, I guess the flash art flash rating of the um, new safety glasses we started getting so they started allowing us to wear contacts yeah we were the same uh in fact we were at one time you couldn't wear uh hard lenses and yep. then they went to both hard and soft lenses you can wear contact uh lenses right what you do not want to do and this is this is uh, critical guys do not wear any kind of prescription glasses or sunglasses that have metal in them Ooh. all right two reasons why they're one metal conducts electricity and two if you're if, if an arc flash occurs that, that's not actual contact of electricity but if a fault or arc flash occurs the temperature of that flash itself is very very high and your sunglasses i've seen cases of it before thank you mm -hmm. uh the guy's got a you know pretty good sunburn on his face and that you know, probably can go away with, with a little bit of care there because of the arc flash, but the the sidebars and the, you know, the uh, lens holder of the glasses have melted into the person's face. So th that uh, metal will be a good conductor of heat also, not just electricity. So do not wear wire <coughs> frame sunglasses while in the workplace. And then of course, everybody's gonna push the limits out there back in the old days. I put my wire ones on, then I put my sunglasses over the top. I've got protection. No, that doesn't work either. No. Okay. All right. So any other questions on safety glasses? Now, if you want to get cool and modern, uh, Jay Harlan surprisingly has some real good prices on Oakley's. Yeah. Safety glasses. Uh, what's another? Costas. They're on his website and uh, they're actually cheaper than they are 
even the safety Z87 style than there are in the retail store. So if you want to look at those, look at those. Any questions on safety glasses? Okay. Let's carry on. So we're in the book. And if you remember here, we talked about this in the math book also. Uh, this electrical studies for trades book, who's it made for? <coughs> Lyman or electrician? Electrician. <laughs> yeah, a, a, a lot of electricians. So, you know, we're going to do some skipping around in it. I'm going to, we're going to be teaching Lyman. We're not going to be teaching electrician. So in the book itself, I've moved up to uh, page 76. I've skipped resistors and we all know resistance in a utility network, we don't want at all. We want to eliminate that as much as we can. So we're not going to go over resistance. We also did skip, and I hope you guys know this by now, Ohm's Law. All right, that, that's been pounded into you so far, when to use it, how to use it. And we're moving up to static charges. That's on the uh, bottom paragraph of page 76. Static elect charges, electrical charges are the common occurrence in everyday life. Almost everyone has received the shock after walking across a carpet and then touching a metal object or sliding across seat covers in a car and touching the door handle. Almost everyone has combed their hair with a hard rubber or plastic comb and then use, where's Roland at? Bushhead, Roland. He must not be in here. I don't think he ever used a comb or brush. That probably has never happened to him. And uh, you know that I'm sure that each of you has experienced the static charge happening when you get out of a vehicle. So what's it caused from? Well, great. You know, what's happening here is you're either shuffling your feet and you're building up a static charge or you're moving up across the seat with a static charge. You are adding positive a more positive value to you. And whenever you touch something that's metallic, that's at a negative value. So you're discharging the more positive value to the negative value. Now, how many volts is in uh, like a snap like that? Any guesses? Ten, twenty, thirty, five thousand. Half a volt. It's it's relatively high. The voltage that you're discharging there when you're doing something like that is very fast, one, and relatively very high, sometimes in the hundreds to 200,000 volts DC. That's a direct current change uh, from positive to negative. But it is so fast, it's so small and minute, no damage is done. So those are very high. Okay, turn the page and we're gonna go to static electricity in nature. Talk about this just a moment. When static electricity occurs in nature, it can be harmful. The best example of, of natural static electricity is lightning. A static charge builds up in clouds that contain a large amount of moisture. And as they move through the air, it is theorized that the movement causes a static charge to build up on the surface of drops of water. Large drops become positively charged as small drops become negatively charged. As you can see by the example on page 79. All right, so lightning strikes occur because of one, the earth is either positive or negatively charged and the charge between the clouds and the rain droplets in the air are opposite of that. Now, common question that's gonna go on out there with customers that you see, and I'm gonna turn over to page, uh, if you look on page 81, should you use a, uh, should a, customer use or have on their house lightning rods no why not isn't it doesn't it attract it more well it's out for debate it, you know some people are thinking out there well if i have a good grounded system on my house and what the lightning rod is meant to do is not be connected to any of your house wiring but go through the rod and through cables and down into the earth with ground rods that are going around the house and not uh, through the house and through your electrical lines. That's the main purpose of it. Uh, there's a couple factors that we got to look in there. Is there resistance in the ground rod and the ground wires going down the house? 
we've talked about this before, is there, is there a perfect conductor or is there a perfect insulator? No. No, there isn't. So there is the possibility that the ground, especially around here at the beach, which is made of sand and sand makes glass, that you don't have a good ground. So uh, lightning rods are not going to be effective. And the other part of it is just like you said, when you say no, and uh, you know, that's your opinion. I'd like to go with that direction also. Lightning rods are meant to do what? Attract lightning. So if you don't want lightning around your house or hitting your house, specifically on the rod, don't use lightning rods. So you kind of have to leave that up to the customer. Now, if you see in the diagram on page uh, 80, if you've got trees and higher objects around your house, what's it gonna strike first? The tree or the house? The tree. If you're living in flatlands and plains, and this is probably where you're gonna see more lightning rods installed, what's it gonna hit first? The lightning rod or the house? Lightning rod. So there you go, there, there's the uh, thing. And you know, customers ask me often, Hey, you know, I'm getting a lot of lightning strikes around the house, blowing out my computer. And I'm like, should I put lightning rods in my house? I kind of leave that one alone. I say, you know, that's your opinion. If you think that uh, attracting lightning to your house is more the way you want it, go ahead and do it. But there's not a 100% cure for lightning as far as that concerned. Now, in the workplace, you as linemen, and the weather comes up, when do you stop work? When do you, I mean, Obviously, you're going to go out there or you're going to use a couple of instances here and jump in here, uh, Professor B. I mean, we're practicing out in rainy situations and 35, 45 degree weather. Do we stop? No. Out there in the field? Did we stop? No, sir. No, sir. No, we don't. Much. Appreciate the answer. We don't stop. And it really gets you in the mode of, well, this is really what I'm going to be working in. I can guarantee you, and Lyman on cruise now are still working. All right. You, you're going to take some extra care as far as, you know, shielding yourself against the temperature. Uh, try not to get wet. Stay dry as possible. But uh, you're not going to stop work. It's going to, is it going to hamper some of the work that you've got? Slow it down. Sure, it's going to slow you down a little bit. Mm -hmm. And the supervisor knows that. And the company knows that. If you're working out there in 20, 30 degree weather, winds blowing, their expectations are not going to be as high as, as, as if it's a nice spring day and everything's great. As far as lightning and thunderstorms, when do you stop? When it's lightning. lightning. How do you know it's lightning? Uh, I guess when you, you see, see the it. lightning strike, you can see it. All right, and I, I heard it out there. When you see the strike, that's too late. If you start hearing thunder in the distance, go ahead and stop. All right, get off the pole, get out of the bucket, bring stuff down to the ground. Uh, our dispatchers and system at dispatch had a nice little system that it could give you a lightning alert. We didn't even hear the thunder. All right. You get a call on the radio, we've got a storm in your vicinity. And I have to agree, we've been out there field a couple of times and we've heard thunder off in the distance and not a cloud over our head and lightning has struck before, hadn't it, Professor V? <clears throat> Professor V's in the mode of, I think he froze up. There he is. I'm back. Okay. We've yeah. had lightning strikes out of the field, right? Mm -hmm. And nothing's been around. Yep, yeah, shaking his head, yes. So, you know, you guys, as soon as you hear the thunder one time and you haven't gotten an alert from your dispatchers, fold it up. Because typically, where are you working at? Up? Up in the air. Up, up in, in the, the air, air exactly. Pole. And you don't want to be anywhere near it. Now, what's the safest sure place to get? And, and I, I know you probably educated on this. What's the safest place to get while you're waiting out a storm? In the truck. In the vehicle. Go ahead and get in the vehicle and just wait it out. Okay. Don't get under a tree or anything like that. <laughs> okay. All right. So we're going to proceed on a little bit further with the book here. 
I'm up to unit four in magnetism. All right. I'm going to go down to page 89. Magnetic lines of force are called flux. What do they mean like that? And when we start working on the uh, properties of magnetism, this is actually how transformation works and are able to get into transformation. Uh, obviously, we cannot have a distribution or transmission electrical system without transformation. It's just not possible in the utility industry. So let me get uh, a picture up here. All right, so this, Okay. I got that, V. You got me? Yeah, I got that message. Okay. Uh, you should see your share screen here, correct? Yeah, that's it. Okay. All right, gentlemen. So on this uh, magnet that I have right here, a north and south magnet, there are lines of force that are coming out of the magnet. Now, the properties of a magnet same poles, what do they do? If I was try to put a North Pole to a North Pole magnet, what are the other two? Attract yeah. or not attract? Yeah. Not, not attract. attract. Not attract. So they're going to try to push each other away. If I've got the North and I try to get it to the South, what's going to try to do? Attract or not attract? Attract. 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 Okay. You'll notice also in this picture, and this is going to come later, later on into uh, our studies right here, where is the most intense lines of force coming off this magnet? On the opposite on the ends. From the ends, okay? You'll see right here, the most intensity of the magnet force power, force energy is coming off the ends of the magnet. So do remember that. Okay, stop that share. All right, so those are called the magnetic lines of force or flux. And goes into magnets and uh, on the next page is pages 90. I'm down to magnetic induction. So here we are gonna get into the electrical part of it. Magnetic induction is one of the most important concepts in the electrical field. It is the basic operating principle underlying alternators, generators, transformers, and most alternating current motors. Notice he doesn't say direct current motors, he says, alternating current motors, AC motors. It is imperative that anyone desiring to work in the electrical field have an understanding of the principles involved. As stated, one of the basic laws of electricity is that whenever current flows through a conductor, a magnetic field is created around that conductor. So even in the plane world. Now, are we using a magnet in this case? Mm -hmm. No. By the patent, excuse me, by the uh, paragraph I just read. So I'm going to start painting up and I'll give you a visual of this. <coughs> this happens everywhere. All right, share screen. Untitled paint. Share. Let me find my trusty. Here it is. Got it. So what the book is saying, and this happens in the in the real world. You got a paint screen up, uh, V? You're good. Thank you. Let's see, pencil. A conductor, and I'm gonna do it from both sides. I don't like that. There you go. Whenever I have a conductor, and I'm going to do it looking down the end of it. So here's my conductor, just like the wires that we're using out in the field. And I draw one in this fashion also. Now, V, you got your book handy there? 
He's having internet issues. He just texted me. I'm going to read it to you. As stated, one of the basic laws of electricity is that whenever current flows through a conductor, a magnetic field is created around the conductor. So what they're saying, as soon as I add amperage or have current flow on a conductor, what is given off? Magnetic field. A magnetic field, magnetic lines of force are given off the conductor in all directions. Obviously, the further I get away from it, what happens? The weaker it gets. The weaker it gets. Now, I'm going to write this note down here at the bottom. Obviously, if I don't have current flowing through the conductor, I'm not going to have a magnetic field, am I? No. No, you're not. But the more current that is on the conductor equals more intense magnetic field. So we're going to give an example right here, and I'll just do it right here at the side. Here's my conductor. I've got one amp on it. The magnetic field is going to be relatively small and diminish not far away from the conductor itself. I've got the same conductor, and I put 100 amps on it. It's going to be intense. And it's going to stretch further out from the conductor. Does that make sense to everybody? Yep. Okay. All right. Same property. I've got it drawn on a look down on this one right here. We're just looking straight down the conductor. And some guys, you, you'll see some images that draw like this. Now we got a side view. Okay. Once again, like I'm saying, it encompasses the entire conductor. All right. Small amount of amperage. We'll say 10 amps here. All right. You put 100 amps on it. You might as well say 10 times the size of the magnetic field that's coming off the conductor, okay? Do you remember, what did they say? What are they calling the lines that are coming out from the conductor? Lines of force. So there's energy being produced. This is force is energy given off the conductor itself, okay? Let's see where we're sitting at on time. 933. 933. Okay. Any questions here as far as what I've drawn out and what we're talking about here as far as the conductor itself? One, on my conductor, I've got to have voltage. That's our pressure. All right. Two, I've got to have some type of load connected to it. Once again, I'm going to draw my light bulb. Once I've turned the light bulb on, I'm going to have current flow. <laughs> okay. And it, if the light bulb is turned off and I've just got voltage pressure on my conductor, do I have a magnetic field coming off of it? No. No, you don't. As soon as the light is turned on, then that conductor is going to start emitting a magnetic field off of it. All right? Does the neutral, all right, I'm going in with a hot wire and I'm coming off down to here. Does the neutral also give off a magnetic field once the light is turned on? If the switch is on. If the switch is on, yes, sir, it does. Okay, so there's a magnetic field across the entire conductor if my light is on. Okay, 9.35, let's go ahead and take 10 and we'll be back at 9.45, 9.45, be back. Okay, I'm showing 9.45, we'll go ahead and get started back. I'm gonna share a screen with a video on it. And we'll go into explanation. Okay, let me know if you see that V. Yes, sir. Okay, 
So I'll give you, before I start the video here, I'll give you some uh, information before we get started. You'll notice on the top here, it says grounding induction on a 500 kV power line. I'd rather they had called it voltage induction on a 500 kV power line. You'll see the guy that's in the bucket truck here. He is preparing to ground the line that's closest to him. And if you can see my uh, pointer over here, get mouse and not the pointer. All right, there's a set of power lines that he's going to be working on. This is a pair. There's another pair off the side here and two more off the side. So he's working on a power line that's de-energized. This part of the line is de-energized that he's preparing to work on. The lines behind him, you see these over here, these are still energized to 500,000 volts. So that's another set of lines that are energized. Energized, back, behind them, de-energized, he's getting ready to work on. So that, and he's getting preparing to ground these lines <coughs> to work on them uh, manually. Okay, so from the beginning, when I gave my explanation here, was the set of lines that he's getting preparing to ground right here, are these energized by the generating station or a transformer? Yes. Right. What did I explain in the beginning? Oh, you mean the ones right under them? Yeah, these are de-energized. The ones that are behind them are energized. Oh, my so bad. I thought your mouse was behind them. Okay. So uh, where's the voltage coming from? The magnetic field. Right. And he calls it induction right here at the top. So let's draw this out. Let's draw this out in a, in a picture to see what's going on. Okay, you should have that other screen up. Yep. All right. So I'm just gonna draw one set of lines and another set of lines, and I'll put the bucket truck in the middle. Behind him, we had 500 kV line. He's over here with a bucket in between. We'll draw a little bucket right here. This line has zero volts on it as far as generation is concerned. It's not connected to anything. So how, when he is grounding it over here, how is he getting voltage off this line? The magnetic field for 500 right. kV. The 500 kV magnetic field, and it was a decent distance away, wasn't it? Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, more than a couple hundred. Sure. Feet. The magnetic field that's coming off this line, and I'll draw it in this fashion, is, and it's a term mm -hmm. they called cutting. It's cutting across the line that is de-energized. Now, remember, he hasn't grounded it yet. That's the process he's doing right now. So this is, gentlemen, what you're looking at right here is really a rudimentary or very basic transformer. So what, what as far as uh, 
concerned as far as the transformer in this, and this is very, very basic. Obviously this line is gonna be very long in distance, and this is gonna be long in distance. So the magnetic field is being given off the entire length. So what's happening here? One, first thing I've got to have to transform electricity and what has to be created is a magnetic field. All right, that's being given off and it's being given off by current that's flowing up and down this transmission line. Two is I've got to have voltage, right? I've got to have pressure and voltage. Now here comes the tough part. In order for this to work, I also have to have movement. It's the basic part of generation and transformation. So movement must occur also. So these lines of force are going, they're going diminishing and they're increasing. They're diminishing and they're increasing. Once I have movement, <coughs> then on this okay. side of my de-energized part, voltage is now created. The two simple parts we know already. How do we get a magnetic field off of a conductor? One, I've got voltage, two, I've got current. Where's the movement coming from? Usage. Well, usage is the current part. Mm. Right? The pole mount transformers that we're using out in the yard, where we're transforming 7,200 down to 240. Do you think there's a little motor inside that's making the uh, coils of the transformer move back and forth? No. No, no. Anything else that you can think of that would make movement in an AC circuit? The, the alternating electrons? You are right very close to it. We talked about this uh, the other day. The amperes? Amperes is the current, current that's flowing. Sine wave. The sine wave, all right? What is it doing? It's moving where? Up, and then guess what? Mm. Down. Current flow is moving back and forth, or forth and back as if out of drawing. That is the movement. There's no mechanical movement, but there is movement in the AC sine wave of peak top, peak bottom, peak top, peak bottom. That's where our movement comes from to be able to create and transform one voltage to another voltage. Now, and it also takes us back also, can I convert AC to AC? Transform it. Yes. Yes, you can. Can I take AC and transform it to DC? Yes. No. Yes, we're not going to worry about too, too much about it. It's called rectifying. So we're only going to take the tops. Can I take DC and convert it to DC? No. No. But why is that? We're missing one component. I can have volts on DC. I can have amps on DC. What's the other, what's the missing component I can't do with DC? The movement. Movement. Remember, it's a straight line. Positive and ground. So there's no movement in DC. Thus, I can't produce voltage on the other side. Okay, any questions there? All right, big things to learn right here. I've got to have voltage. I got to have amperage. And I have to have movement, which is an AC sine wave, in order to transform one voltage to another. Okay, I'm going to go to a video here.
Let's see, where was it at? Escape out of that. And listen to this guy from the land down under. Mm -hmm. Start from the beginning. In this video, we're going to be looking at transformers. And here's an example from my microwave oven. It consists of two coils, a primary and a secondary. And these are surrounded by a very substantial piece of iron. The iron actually goes through the middle of these two cores, and this is something what we call an E-core. forms an E-shaped with an end plate on it. The primary is much thicker wire because it carries more current, and the secondary has a lot more windings on it, and we'll see why later, but basically this transform has 240 volts in and around 2,000 volts out. It's what we call a step-up transformer. So what we'll do is have a look at how does this thing... Okay, so did you get what he said right there? He's got two separated coils. How many volts went in? 240. 240, and how many volts came out? 2,000. 2,000. So this is actually a step-up transformer. And we know we can do that because we've talked about having a regular uh, utility company transformer. If you put 240 in, what's going to come out the top? 720. 7,200, right? Yeah, this is the same concept that he's using right here in his explanation work. Transformer relies on two key physics principles. Can y'all hear that? Magnetism and electromagnetic induction. Electromagnetic. Yeah. It sounds very low to me. Hold on one second. Yeah. I'll boost it up here a little bit. This guy doesn't talk too loud. There, here we go. Magnetism is when an electrical current generates a magnetic field. Electromagnetic induction is where a magnetic field causes an electrical current to flow. As you can see, one is just the reverse of the other. The basic transformer construction consists of a primary coil magnetically linked via an iron core to a secondary coil. Okay, so we were looking at this picture right here. If you remember that our transmission line, when we were using that example and he was grounded it, he just used one straight line, okay? And then the other side, we had the conductor that was de-energized, we'll say this is this side, and the magnetic field was just cutting against the straight conductor. When I introduce coils, as you see on the left-hand side, and coils on the secondary side, right-hand side, and I introduce an iron core, what we're doing here is we're focusing in intensifying the magnetic field. So the magnetic field is actually traveling around the core, the iron core that you see here, from one magnetic field to the other coil right here to be able to produce voltage. On the uh, transmission one that we saw in that previous video here, that was miles and miles of conductor at very high voltage on one side, right? To be able to condense this and make it work in a more user-friendly environment, like our transformers we have here at the field, we can intensify our magnetic field, one, by coiling the conductor that you see on this side. Actually, think of it. It is making the conductor longer, but in a small space. And we can introduce an iron core. So once we create that magnetic field, it starts flowing, and that field flows the iron core until the output coil, which is, of course, just like we said, makes a long distance shorter and we have an output voltage. Is there any questions there as far as focusing and condensing magnetic fields to transform? One thing I wanna add here, there is no contact, the coil itself and the iron core, there is no physical contact either between the coil wires that you see each of the dual one, or the iron core itself, they're insulated from each other. Obviously, if I took 7,200 <laughs> volts and made direct contact with the core, it would be a fault, it would be a dead short. So they're insulated from each other. But when I make the coils in this fashion right here, it does create the magnetic field. 
and that magnetic field is then transferred to the core. Same thing on the secondary side. No contact between each individual coil and no contact to the iron core. All we want to do is now receive that magnetic field, which is a no contact situation onto my secondary coil. Sorry about that. The iron actually goes through the middle of these two cores, and this is something what we call an E-core. forms an E-shaped with an end plate on it. The primary is much thicker wire because it carries more current, and the secondary has a lot more windings on it, and we'll see why later, but basically this transformer has 240 volts in and around 2,000 volts out. It's what we call a step-up transformer. So what we'll do is have a look at how does this thing work. The transformer relies on two key physics principles, electromagnetism and electromagnetic induction. Electromagnetism is when an electrical current generates a magnetic field. Electromagnetic induction is where a magnetic field causes an electrical current to flow. As you can see, one is just the reverse of the other. The basic transformer construction consists of a primary coil magnetically linked via an iron core to a secondary coil. The primary coil generates a magnetic field and the secondary coil converts that magnetic field back into a flow of current or a voltage. So if we look at what goes on in a wire when we pass a current through it. When we pass a current through a wire, the red arrow is representing the increase in current flow. A magnetic field is formed. To get a stronger magnetic field, we flow, get more current to flow through the wire. Alternatively, what we can do is use two wires. Doubling the wires effectively doubles the current flow past a certain point, and therefore it doubles the magnetic field strength. We can use this in a transformer to make some very strong magnetic field by using a coil. We can use this principle of multiple wires to greatly increase the strength of an electromagnet. By looping a wire into a coil, the same current carrying conductor passes the same point repeatedly. The magnetic field from each wire effectively adds together and makes for a very strong magnet. So if we look at what goes on in a transformer core, if we start with our coil of wire, if we now take a cross section through the coil and only consider the wires going into and out of the screen. By convention, we represent objects going into and out of the page using dots and crosses. And imagine an arrow, an arrow being fired from a bow. If you can see the cross of the feathers of an arrow, it's traveling away from you. If you can see the point of the arrow, it's heading towards you. We can now add the magnetic field of each conductor as we have seen previously. The magnetic fields actually add together, creating one larger magnetic field. And we can represent this with field lines showing the combined or the resultant magnetic field. What we can then do is wrap this coil around an iron core instead of a loop of iron. Now when we do this, because magnetism passes through iron much, much better than it does through air, we actually find that the magnetic field is constrained within the iron core. It permeates the iron core. Permeates just means travels through, basically. I okay, so if you remember my previous video, when we had conductor just out there in air, what direction did the magnetic field go? As far as off the conductor <laughs> itself? Clockwise. I don't need uh, turns, I need direction. Did it give off like 360 degrees? It just emanated completely out of the conductor, right? Yeah. Once I introduce a magnetic core or an iron core such as this, now it's gonna follow the core line. And if you see this, the core itself with the blue lines inside of it, it's gonna attract that magnetic field and it's gonna travel around the whole core. So that's what I meant by focusing. It's just not going to emanate at 306 degrees. It's going to go directly into the core and follow the core line. Now, he hasn't added secondary conductors to it yet. And once again, I will state, you see each individual one of these wires of the coil that he has going around, there is no contact with the core. These wires are not touching the core on either side. 
but the magnetic field that's being emanated off the coil is being introduced in the core and going around the core. Iron can be uh, several thousand times better at uh, conducting a magnetic field than air. So if we now look at the primary side of the transformer, um, we can see how we generate this magnetic field which passes through the secondary coil. And what we'll now look at is induction in the secondary coil. The principle of induction involves moving a magnetic field past the conductor. In this view, as we move the magnet. Okay, so you heard what he said right there. In order for me to create the current that's going to flow through that, I need to move the magnetic field through the conductor. He said move, we didn't say movement, but there has to be some kind of motion of the magnetic field through the conductor for current to be created on the other secondary side. Through the wire, some electrons move. We move the magnet the other way and the electrons move in the opposite direction. Key thing is if I move the magnet faster, more electrons move. So the faster I move the magnet, the greater the current flow. But key to this is it's a moving magnetic field that causes the electrons to move. In other words, a changing magnetic field generates a current. So let's have a look at that inside the transformer. First, looking at the primary side of the coil, the red arrows represent the magnitude of the current. So bigger arrows, bigger current. I increase the voltage, the current increases, and I get a, a growing magnetic field. But once the current is the same, the magnetic field is static, it stays the same. So let's look at that again. Increase in voltage, increase in current, change in magnetic field, voltage stays the same, current stays the same, magnetic field stays the same. The key thing is, the voltage is only induced in the secondary coil when the magnetic field is changing. So as long as the mag magnetic field is changing, we've got the voltage in the secondary coil. But once the magnetic field stays the same, there's no voltage induced. So just watch that again. And it's used in the first movement field, and then the make remaining the constant. But when there's no change in magnetic field, we have no voltage. So what we actually need is an So if you look at this, look at this diagram that he's shown right here, on the movement part when he was going up in the slope right here, voltage was being produced. But once he became static right here at the top, he's got voltage, but there's no movement to it. What do we have in our output of the, of the coils on the other side? How many volts? Zero. Zero. Okay, we're sitting at zero. Input voltage changes constantly. And we can do this using a sine wave. As you can see, the sine wave constantly changes voltage, which constantly causes a change in magnetic field, which means we're always going to have a voltage induced on the secondary. So we now have uh, seen how a voltage and a current flow can be induced in the secondary. The induced voltage depends on the strength of the magnetic field and the number of turns on the secondary coil. More turns on the secondary will generate a larger voltage. The strength of the magnetic field, though, depends upon the number of turns on the primary. Okay, so we'll keep note of that and then we'll get to a drawing here in just a moment. All right, if I want to increase or decrease my voltage, all I need to do is increase or decrease the size of my magnetic field. How do I do that in a transformer? Add or subtract coils. So the voltage output of a transformer depends on the relationship between the number of turns on the primary and the number of turns on the secondary. So let's now have a look at that relationship. Okay, I'm not going to get into the formula part of it. So I'm just going to make, I'll make this a little bit easier on you. Hold on one second. This is the transformer formula, and it's one that you need to know. It simply tells us that if we take the ratio of the voltages, secondary divided by primary, it's the same as the Stop. ratio of the turns, secondary divided by primary. Okay, we'll go to Microsoft Paint. Bow. Newness. Don't say Okay, and this is, guys, I'm glad you're done with math because this is the, this is gonna factor into it right here. I'm gonna draw how you draw a diagram of a transformer. Coils, 
and then grounded. And I'm gonna introduce 7,200 volts here. I'd like to use what we already need to know. Are you drawing yeah. the paint screen? I am, yeah. do you not see anything? No, we just see the YouTube video, Mr. Shoemaker. All right, stand by, thank you. Yes, sir. How's that? That's it. Okay. So here's my primary, and I, you know, I like to draw them in relation to in location of a transformer. <coughs> here's my secondary voltage coming out. Not right to scale there, but good enough. All right, center, neutral. I'm gonna do 120 and 120 volts on each to neutral. And of course, both of these combined together equals 240. All right. So what he's explaining there, and, and this is because, because the industry transformer uh, makers out there, the industry that makes them, uh, we don't need to fluctuate in voltage at all. We need to have a standard is what they're saying there is if I have a transformer, I've got to have a certain amount of coil <laughs> on the primary side and a certain amount of coils on the secondary side in order to convert 7,200 volts to 240 volts. Remember, we always use the full voltage that when we're computing out here. So this really boils down to something very simple. And I'm just going to, this is not the case in actual transformers, but I'm going to use these numbers just to help you out. 7,200 volts, 240 volts. Remember our math? What do we do for ratios here? 240 divided by 7,200. What do we get? Uh, 0 0.033. No. I think it's going over 30. All right, it's one, it's one to 30, all right? So really what we have here as far as the ratio, before we used to use amps, right? To make a computation. This ratio that you have in the transformer is also the winding ratio. Make it easy on you guys. So, and it's gonna go like this, and I'm just gonna draw this here. It's not true to fact. Just, we're just doing the math part of it. How many coils do I have here? One, correct? Am I still in the room? Yep. Okay. Can you still see it? Yep. Yeah, you guys can yeah. chat out anytime. All right, I'm gonna use the full gamut, one, Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. You get the concept. How many windings am I going to have on my secondary side? Four. 30. 30. There you go. Excellent. So the winding ratio is in direct relation to the ratio of the voltage that's being transformed. Okay. I'll give you one more example right here 4,800. Volts, my output's 480 volts. What's the winding ratio? One to 10. One to 10, excellent. Okay, you guys got, well, you got it, Scott. Hope the rest of the guys got that too. So your winding ratio is one to 10, all right? The more, you, and it's got to stay this way the whole time to be able to produce the output voltages that we want. Okay, we have not talked KVA or wattage yet, have we? We've talked winding ratios in relation to voltages. When you start increasing in wattage output or KVA, this is what happens. My primary is going to have, and I'm just gonna draw a couple in here, 30 primary turns. How much in a 7,200 volt to 240 volt transformation, how many secondary turns do I need? 
one to 30. I've got 30 primary turns. How many secondary? 90. 90. Okay. I've not, this does not change my voltage because I kept the ratio the same, one to 30. So 30 times 30 is what? 900. 900. 900. Okay. Now that I've introduced more coils and more conductor, a bigger magnetic field here, now I'm starting to drive up my wattage. Now I can increase my wattage of output of the transformer. The KVA will become larger. Okay. 300 turns, 9,000. 3,000 turns, 90,000 turns turns. Okay, you get the concept. Every time you increase turns, the ratio check stays the same, but my wattage output grows and grows and grows. As long as I you just keep, keep adding time, zero, keep adding turns. As long as I keep adding turns, I've got to maintain the same ratio. If I go 3000 to 50,000 here, my voltage won't jive. My 240 is going to go uh, up ex extremely, and we don't want that. So if we need to increase KVA, all we need to do is increase turns on both the primary and the secondary side. Any questions there? Okay. <laughs> Not sure. What time is it, V? Looking at 10:17. Uh, I feel like I've been talking for a long time. We came back at 10:45. Yeah. All right. Is that share stopped? Share has stopped. All right. Let me check something here real quick. You cannot minimize while you're. Okay. Let's see. All right. <coughs> Okay, next that one. The attached sign, how many? Okay, current flows and conductor, correct. The intensity, there must be three existing conditions, ratios directly, transform with properties to make movement with the magnet, the strongest lines of force, right? Okay. All right, so let's go ahead and take a break here. Another 10. Yep. And we'll move on to new business.